How's your Sunday? Nice, that's good. Um, yeah, a lot of times we're just really hungover on Sunday, but I'm not as much this year for a change. Water is good. Yeah, this is the first photo op I didn't feel like I was gonna pass out in the middle. So that's great. So I got that going for me 10 years in. <laughs> um, yeah, part of the reason is I spent the night here last night, so there wasn't as many people to drink with. So, I went to sleep, like a normal person. Thank you, thank you, thank you, I deserve that. <laughs> um, yeah, did you like the concert last night? Good. Yeah, that was, that was really fun, I had a blast. It was fun to sing with Jason again, and you know, and a lot of people said that, you know, they haven't seen us, um, play live in Europe, you know, because we really haven't. Um, and I haven't, I mean, I haven't played with Jason like that in a really long time, so that was fun for me, too. Hi. Hi, I thought I was going to bend you for a bit more. I thought it was going to also, but then I saw you standing there, and I was like, I don't I want mean, to. I was, I was here to put pressure on you, so that <laughs> yeah, worked. It worked. <laughs> Sweating. Yeah, good. Well, we all are, so that's fair. <laughs> it's, it's hot. Um, you mentioned on, I think it was Friday, I want to say, sure. um, about, like, someone asked about comedic versus like dramatic scripts. Oh, yes. And you're talking about um, enjoying putting like little bits and stuff into comedic scripts. I was wondering if you had like a, a favorite that comes to mind that you've like inserted uh, into. Like all my work or just supernatural? Any, whatever comes to mind first. Um, yeah, so you're asking about like in a, a lot of times in a, I'll, well, I guess in a, whether it's a drama or a comedy, I'll put my own little sort of spin on it. Um, you know, uh, gosh, there's a lot, a lot of stuff. A lot of times I just love it when they just like, the scene ends but the camera's still rolling and I'll just like add some stuff. Um, at the end of the episode, The Real Ghostbusters, where I'm like on stage at the convention, that was fun. Cause that was, Eric Kripke had written me to say all these things, but then I improv some of them as well. And that was really, that's, that was a fun little improv thing I, I got to do on Supernatural. Um, do you remember that convention episode? Anyway, so, um, but the other thing that comes to mind as sort of like all-time favorite moment in my career, um, early when I, when I auditioned for Felicity, so this was like 1998, 99, um, it was a big deal for me. It was a big show that I really wanted to be a part of and I auditioned and the role, the scene that I auditioned for, my character, he was like, he's like this bitter, this dorm student that's gonna report his, his RA, who's, who's like the counselor, because he catches him making out with Felicity in the library. And so in the scene, he comes in and it's written, um, I'm, you're, hey, you're, my, you're an RA, you're not supposed to be making out with a student, I'm gonna report you, I'm gonna report your ass. And when I did the audition, I just did, I only, this is the, the way that I heard it, but it's not the way that they, were hearing it and it really made them laugh. And so it, it was just like me being quirky, I guess. Um, but J.J. Abrams wrote, you know, he created Felicity and he wrote the episodes that he was in there uh, in the audition, which now seems like a huge deal because it's J.J. Abrams, but at the time, no one really knew who that was. But I really wanted to be on the show. He's the producer of the show. And I come into audition for him and I went, um, I'm gonna report you. I'm gonna report your ass. And like that really made him laugh that I said it like that and I didn't say it the way that he had that envisioned it, which was like, I'm gonna report your ass. And so anyway, the fact that I put the emphasis on your ass, that really got me the job. And so then I had that job for four seasons and that was awesome. So, and I, re I remember even when I did it on set, Carrie Russell was like, have you heard the way that he's doing this line? For some reason, that really made them laugh that I was doing your ass. So that was a spin that I put on it that worked. So that really comes to mind. Who knew asses would have such a big effect on your career? I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I guess like if I wrote like a, um, 
I think a biography or whatever, that was like an important turning point for me. Um, and just learning how to put your own spin on something and make it yours. And it was back in the day when like we really would go in rooms to audition, which I really miss because now everything's on tape. You just, when you audition, you literally put yourself, video yourself and you send it away. And then some other room, somebody watches it and then they make a decision. But I, I liked being in the room in person where you could be weird and quirky and, and Lord knows I had a lot of that. A lot of weird and quirky and a lot of times weird and quirky got me the part. Um, it's hard to be weird and quirky on a videotape because you're not like coming going, hi, I'm Rob, uh, this is that, here's the scene. You just like action and you're doing it. So I almost feel like I have more, I'd get more parts if they just left the camera rolling and I'm like doing the quirky, awkward stuff before the scene starts. <laughs> I should maybe do that more. <laughs> hi. Hi. It's a bit low. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, yesterday or the day before, I don't remember well, you were talking about that someone said to you that they kind of hate you because of uh, Chuck character. And uh, I wanted to ask your opinion, like, if Chuck as a prophet and Chuck as a god were sitting there beside you, what would you say to them? Hmm. Well, Chuck the prophet, the writer Chuck, um, I would say, hey, go outside and get some fresh air. <laughs> he did that. And ultimately, yeah. But yeah, at the beginning, the first, the season four check, I'd be like, hey, take a breather, drink some water. Because um, he didn't get out much and he wasn't good with people. <laughs> um, and then God, Chuck, I'd be like, hey, maybe stay in. <laughs> you go out too much. <laughs> just, just stay in. Um, yeah, and maybe I'd say to God, Chuck, like, hey, man, it's, it's not worth it. Don't, don't destroy this final world. Keep this one going, or else you're going to lose your job. Uh, so yeah, that's what I'd say to him. So they get opposites. Chuck, Prophet Chuck needs to go out more. God Chuck needs to stay in more. Um, ultimately, they were the same person, weren't they? And uh, yeah, I still like to think that that God Chuck is, is still writing the story that we saw, even though he's not God anymore, because Alex took it from me. Because <laughs> Jack took it from me. Um, I still like to think that he's still in control, that well, that's still his story. He kind of can occupy the Metatron's spot, you know, since Metatron is not like the scrap of God anymore. Right, <laughs> could be, that's right, could be. Um, yeah, yeah, I like to, I'd like to think that, in the, I'd like to think in that very, like, a, a fan had this idea and I thought it was a really good idea, like at the, when the whole show's over, and they're on the bridge waving and that's, and out, end of season, end of, end of series. But then it's like a book that closes and it's God. It's Chuck going like, hope, Nobody liked that. hope you enjoyed it. I think they would love that, I think. Thank uh, you. Anyway, yeah, you're welcome. to your podcast with Rich, the Thank Supernatural you. Then and Now. Yeah. Uh, I haven't caught up all the way yet, but I was wondering if there's any episodes that you were super surprised by um, and maybe it's your favorite so far. Um, I keep getting surprised by so many of the episodes because either they're like better than I imagined it would be or, um, you know, uh, different than I imagined it would be. Um, season one I really enjoyed, which I, I feel like when they're retelling Supernatural, they always go, well, we, first it was Monster of the Week, you know. And in my mind, I guess that meant like, that it wasn't as good, but it was very enjoyable. I really enjoyed season one. Um, and, and that season, standout episodes for me were um, the, the one with the, the preacher, yeah, faith. Faith. That was so good. It's good, right? 
And I kind of like Scarecrow. Something about Scarecrow that I like. Because there's that scene where like Dean's up on the ladder in front of the Scarecrow. That was terrifying. Because that was like a real person. And that would terrify me. There are honest to God scary moments in this show where I'm really scared. Um, I... Jeffrey Dean Morgan was in more than I expected he was going to be, and the whole la the whole end of season one was like whoa, cr crazy cool and great. But then the first episode of season two, I, I also really liked a lot, where Dean's like in the hospital and almost dies. And even though I know that he lives, I was scared he was going to die. Um, but also, what I really liked about that is like you just I did not expect that to be where we you know that it wasn't monster of the week. You know, it picks up and you're like, whoa, okay, they're taking it to another level. So I really enjoyed that, that episode a lot. And Jeffrey D. Morgan is great in it. And um, yeah, and I still don't know how mom, who burned mom on the ceiling. Um, but I, I'm going to find out, hopefully. I mean, ultimately, it's you. I, it's, ultimately, <laughs> yeah, I know. It's a good point. That's a, that's a great, crazy good point. <laughs> like, who's doing all these awful things? It's me. <laughs> that's a great point. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, yeah, the yellow-eyed demon is, you know, a big part of this season. So, yeah, I'm excited about that. Um, you know, just because I really haven't seen him much. Um, yeah, and just introduction of characters that are friends of mine. I've never seen Chad Lindbergh on the show. So when I first saw Ash, I was like, oh, wow, there's Chad. Um, yeah, and Gabe Tigerman, so great. Um, so yeah, that, that's been fun too. Um, yeah, <laughs> I'm going to use that in the podcast, what you just said. It's really funny. <laughs> I'm Natalie. Okay, Natalie, you got it. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is, the empty is supposedly like a powerless zone. And like, so everyone said that Death doesn't have a power there and Chuck doesn't have power there, but then Jack brought back Castiel and your character too, like a couple of times. So what do you think? How does this work? Like, what's the hierarchy? <laughs> So uh, you're saying I Chuck doesn't have power there? Some of the characters I don't remember. It's right. fifteen season. Sorry. Uh, what season was that? I some of the in fifteen season or fifteen right. season. I don't remember. I mean, I think Chuck always had power until that very very last moment when when Jack took it back from him. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I don't. know. What do you think? I don't know. Like so. I asked before I came to this convention on Twitter if anyone has a question, and someone mentioned that this is something that we still didn't figure out and haven't found a question, so I thought I'd ask you. No, it's great. You, you came to the right place, <laughs> um, except that you, you came to the wrong place, because I don't know, but we should ask one of the writers of the show, because I really don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, all I know is I do think that Chuck always had the power. Even when we thought he didn't, he did. Until Jack zzz, took it away from him at the very end. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that all worked. I don't know how that worked. Um, gosh, I wish I could give you an answer that you could go back and tell them on the Twitter. Um, just Rob says that Chuck always had the power. Sorry. Sometimes you just don't know the answer. You just are just an actor saying lines. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, so in March 2020, there was supposed to be a, con a Loud and Swain concert in Boston, and it was supposed to be a day before my birthday. Aww. And then COVID happened. Yeah. So I was wondering if there's a, a tour planned maybe a US tour or just Boston? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, there's no tour planned yet, but we will um, get back. You know, this year, there's so many makeup conventions 
that we're so busy doing the conventions um, through the end of the year, we've got about two a month. Um, and so we just don't have time to do a tour. But next year, there are gonna be less, fewer conventions. So we'll have more time to do things like, we'd like to do these, what we call pocket tours, where we go Boston, New York, maybe DC, you know, maybe Chicago, St. Louis, as a different, you know, Milwaukee, you know, Portland, Seattle, you know, stuff like that. So we'll, we'll do more of that kind of thing. So next year, I'm sure we'll be back. Um, I think we're gonna have a album release party in Los Angeles in like November for our new album. But uh, yeah. So, but we'll, we'll uh, circle back to Boston because we owe Boston a show. Yeah, because that was a great year. We had a show in Chicago and a show in somewhere in Seattle. And then, um, and then we were supposed to have that show in Boston and it never happened, did it? Well, if uh, March 22nd is available. Okay. <laughs> That'd be nice. Okay. We'll work, I'm working on it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we have a new album coming out in November. We're very excited about it. Loud and Swain, new music that you've never heard before. So I'm excited to play this. I'm really excited about it. I've been, I'm more excited about it than, than I've been about uh, our music in, in, a, in a while, just because it's so fresh and it was fun to, to write together again. And uh, yeah, I've been listening to it in my car. Like, it's my favorite songs right now. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Rob. On stage, as you say, you're quirky, I think a little bit bashful at times as well, but when you're playing and singing, it's like a switch flips. What happens like that? What makes that happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, you know, I, I find, I guess, this place where within the music that I've written, where I just feel safe, and um, it's almost like, um, I mean, it's the same kind of switch when I'm acting, you know, and it's, it's almost like someone gives you the keys and they say, hey, it's okay, you know, you're safe here, you can do this. You, you can be an asshole because that's these parts that I play that I would never say or do these things to anybody, but someone's going, it's okay, you know, and so you can try that out in the, within the realms of that scene you're safe to, to be free and you have to open yourself up to it as an actor in those moments. And on stage, it's just, it's weird because they're, these are very personal songs that I've written. Sometimes they mean a lot to me. And something happens in the, in the song where I feel safe within the music and with the guitar and with the microphone and with, you know, obviously something is, that we've developed a relationship in terms of like the supernatural world and being able to play for you and we all, um, this is a very safe room. Um, so it just, I just feel safe to, to be myself, to be myself and to, to try that out, you know? And um, yeah, it's, it's uh, I just, I feel safety to be completely vulnerable in that moment. And, you know, and, and, it's, and it's, it's cathartic. Um, so yeah, so I, I guess just it does. You're right. Just a, 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 a switch flips, and and I can really lose myself in it. And um, yeah, I, I can't. Oh, I can't. Honestly, I can't totally explain it other than it. Uh, it feels okay to do, and and it's therapy for me. <laughs> you know, it's it's like it's it's like screaming into your pillow or, or, or going, taking a run or something. You're getting this, this anxiety out within the music. Um, and it's beautiful. Okay. Thank you. Oh no, something's happening. Someone's here. It's Jason Bird. Hey guys. serious statement and then the next person comes on stage and the music kicks in. 
I was that, actually just that, that moment. Yeah. I was like, something happens when I'm singing these songs, and it's just incredibly personal. Like, <laughs> I was told to deliver that to you. I don't. I. Okay, this is my first drink of the day. It's just apple juice. Oh, so it is not. Um, hi. Hi, how, yes. how are you? Good, how are you? Good. We were talking, me and my friends here were talking about how, how great it was that we got to play together last night. It's been a while. It has been too long. I know. As much as we've kind of played, you know, the band... Near each other. Near each other, yeah. right. We haven't really done more than just Hallelujah. We haven't done anything else. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, we should, we should do that more. We should do that. Yeah. And I, I don't come to, on Friday anymore to the conventions, so we used to sing together Friday. That's right. And we don't do that anymore. We don't. That's it. We should just, you know, move in together, get a place, start a band. Let's make it serious. Let's do it. Um, I should have answered with this question that you just had over here. I, um, alcohol also helps. <laughs> and I'm not saying that you should try that. I'm not condoning that. But it does help. Make you feel safe. <laughs> They're like, how do you, you seem so bashful on stage sometimes. Like, how do you, when the, when the song starts, you the opposite of that. I was trying to explain what that process is within the music you write. How you can kind of like. Yeah. The, when uh, we first met, I remember that was often a topic of conversation um, with us because you're, um, in person, hilarious, but very thoughtful with, you know, what you're saying and what you're doing. And sensitive. You know, and yeah, sensitive. Questioning. And, and, and making sure that like, you know, you you give a lot of space, you know, like in, in the room and when you're talking with people, you're very generous with that energy. Um, but when you get on stage, watch out. <laughs> I remember all of us, like the first time we saw you performing with your band, we were like, what the, huh? who's that? Who, huh? <laughs> yeah, I still, I still, I still take notes. I still take my notebook out and watch you when you're performing with Loud and Swain and just your use of the stage and your, you know, confidence. And I, I write all those notes and then I study those notes intently and and then I go on stage and stand in the same place. <laughs> don't don't do it. You know I've taken a lot of notes watching people that I'm inspired by. You know I mean I take page pages out of the like, you know my favorite lead singers. In terms of being a lead singer of, of Loud and Swain, which is even different than what I did last night, which is a different thing. But yeah, when I'm on there with the the band, I'm I'm channeling Eddie Vedder. Or, Tom York or whoever the people that I've inspired by performers like that. That's cool. Yeah. Like not just the music, but like you watch the performance and see how they kind of carry. Yeah, Eddie Vedder does is just a great front man and he I mean he you know, he he used to do this thing where he would take he would take like a take something that would like a plate like a plate or something that would the, when the spotlight would hit it, it would bounce and he and, and spotlight the crowd. So he'd take the spotlight at him and he'd take like a like a silver plate or something that would that would bounce the light and he'd shine it on the on the audience and he'd go around the entire arena. And of course the audience would like when the spotlight's on them like eh. and it was just a cool little thing like that that you know what I mean? Just get the crowd into it and Yeah. And knowing where you're playing and talking about that city, or so, you know, just stuff like that. That's yeah. you know, I don't always do that, but like he's really great about that. Did it last night. Did I? Roma Sky. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Sorry, I I know that this is for you guys. I'm I'm just taking notes. I'm having a little. I'm getting a, a study <laughs> session in. So when you're writing songs, um, <laughs> do you have a question? Uh, I was thinking that was be really stress stressful for you guys to be here and to don't know what people are going to ask you. So I was thinking, what it what was the weirdest or the awkwardest question that you've been asked? That one a couple questions ago. No, I'm just kidding. Um, weirdest question that we've been asked. 
Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it, we've been asked so many different things now. It, it's hard to it's hard to to make us feel. Yeah, I feel like you get so used to um, listening to the question. There is a little bit of a moment of like, uh oh. Yeah. But when you hear it, there's a moment when they're asking when you decide answer or say something funny. Right. Yeah. Right. So if, if it starts to get awkward or there's a question that you're not allowed to answer or right. something, then you just think of a joke like yeah. this. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. And, you know, there, I mean, Richard always hates the questions that are like, if you were a tree, what kind of tree would you be or something like that? Yeah. I kind of think that's fun. It's funny because you can just improv your way through the answer. Um, but honestly, I get really stressed out when it's questions about the show that I should know because I play God and I really don't know. Like the question this young lady asked about the empty or whatever that was and whether who has power there or whatever, like I have no idea and I'm kind of sweating a little under my armpits going like, right, so uh, how, do I, how do I answer this? Uh, and um, so, yeah, but I'm trying to think about a specific question. You know, there have been times when people were like, oh, do you have a funny story that you could tell with like Matt, Richard and I or something? And we'd start to tell like, oh crap, I can't say this out loud. <laughs> this, is, this is R-rated or this is, you know, not safe. <laughs> Not safe for work, <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, or like Matt. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. There's a there's like one, that. Yeah. That one. Like yeah, that you remember one. that one time? Like that thing. Yeah. You remember? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you for the question. Yeah. Like, well, I, I'll tell, I can tell you guys because there's mostly adults in this room. But there was a, there was a story, a funny story that happened with Matt and Richard and I when we were in Paris a few years ago. Where uh, earmuffs, Nico. Okay, yeah, where a fan asked us, where a fan asked us to go like this, and we were like, I don't think we can do that, and she was asking us to yawn, <sighs> but she was like, <sighs> and we we're like, I can't, we can't do that. It was a really funny story. We're crying with laughter, and she just wants to be yawning. And we didn't understand that, and so that really made us laugh, and Matt retold that recently, and we're having a howling, retelling that story, look out, there are like, all oh, these little kids there, are like, uh, this is not appropriate <laughs> to be telling. So anyway, things like that, that's awkward. So really, we're the awkward ones. <laughs> the questions are great. <laughs> yeah, French people, you know. French people are <laughs> we, the best. I say that because I'm French, yeah. don't worry, guys. Je <laughs> t'aime. Okay. Je t'aime aussi. <laughs> Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Merci. Hi. Hello, how are you today? Not Good. bad. Good. I have a bit of a silly question for you, Rob. Okay. Um, so there's a pretty iconic Chuck line in season four, The End, when he tells um, Dean to hoard toilet paper. Yeah. And I was just wondering if that made you sort of feel like a prophet when the pandemic hit. <laughs> yeah. Totally. And if you've ever had any moments like other, other than that where you kind of felt like it was just something that kind of foretold something. I mean, that, that, that was awesome. That was, you know, a lot of times I'm like, yeah, I'm just an actor, I don't know. But for that one, I was like, see, told you. Um, yeah, I think I was a meme or something. My son was like, Dad, Dad, you're a meme. And I was like, I don't even know what that is, but that's great. Um, so yeah, that was pretty cool. And it was really, that's Eric Kripke, you know, wrote that. And so it's like, he's the, he's the prophet there. Um, but crazy that it really did. People were hoarding toilet paper. Like it's made of gold. Um, and it was. And it was. <laughs> that was honestly one of the most, that was one of the most surreal moments of the pandemic for me. It really was. Was when they were hoarding toilet paper. Yeah. And I was like, how did they know? I know. <laughs> really crazy. Yeah, that was awesome. Um, I don't think there any been any other moments like that. Not, not really. I mean, you know, on the flip side of that, I read a lot of chatter online about like, you know, the world is ending, and in 2020, and it's just like Chuck said, or this is Chuck's fault. So people were like blaming me for the end of the world. <laughs> They were like crediting me for the toilet paper thing and then blaming me for that it was all going down. And it really felt like they really thought it was my fault. And that hurt. But you know, 
I got over it, and it didn't end, did it? We're still here. And we um, have nine more seasons of Earth. Yeah, just nine? <laughs> Eleven, I guess. Yeah, what was that, season four? Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah. But then season 15 is like when I was like, it's over, show's over, you're all, it's ending, I'm ending it, and then it really did happen, start to happen. Yeah. You'd be like, it's Chuck, it's Chuck's fault, he's ending the world. I, I, I was really scared of you for a while. I was scared of me. <laughs> I woke up in the morning, looked in the mirror, I was like, huh? <laughs> what did you do? Get out of my life, Chuck. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so anyway, thankfully we're all here, but that was another weird moment. The, the, acting on the show and playing a guy who's like, it's over, and he's caused all this death and destruction on the TV screens, and that actually was kind of what was happening in 2020. Like murder hornets, what? <laughs> uh, so yeah, that felt like it was my fault. <laughs> on top of everything. Mm -hmm. Well, we love you, Rob. Thank you. You know it wasn't your fault. Thank you very much. Thank you. You guys are too kind. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, my question is for Rob. Um, in the past days, at some point, you mentioned that you're a very huge fan of Pearl Jam, and I heard you yesterday at the concert, and I heard some parts or some hints of Pearl Jam uh, in your performance. So my question for you is, um, did Pearl Jam inspire, uh, like, did you take inspiration from them for your songwriting or your performance? Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, they're just one of the bands I've really connected with um, at a certain age, and they really stuck with me. And like I said, uh, I thought Eddie Vedder was just a great frontman and such a great lyricist. He's just a great lyricist, and you know, his job in that band, besides being a songwriter, is he'll, he's the lyric writer. So the other guys will give him songs and he writes the lyrics, and that's what I do in Loud and Swain too, so I'm inspired by what he does. Um, he, he, yeah, so I, I just take, like we said, take pages out of that notebook. You know, I, I get inspired just to write music in that way. Um, I think my songs may be a little more personal. I mean, so he's got some really personal songs, but he's also a great storyteller, so he'll tell stories about other people. It doesn't, not necessarily true. My old mind kind of, even if I'm talking about somebody else, most of my songs are ultimately just about me. But uh, even if I call myself something else or, you know, doing something that, that's a metaphor for something I'm going through. Um, but yeah, I'm inspired by his ly lyrics and his, his songwriting ability. Um, so yeah, it, it's just, I think, um, and, and you know, he's, uh, yeah, he does things like he often uses the ocean as a metaphor because he's a surfer and he's just, he finds inspiration in the ocean. Um, and I feel like I'm inspired by that simply through his metaphor, you know what I mean? And so I wrote the song Wave, that's very, you know, ocean metaphor. And, and that's not consciously, but now that I look back, like that's a very Pearl Jammy thing to do because, you know, he writes a lot about the ocean and the waves. And, um, so, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I always uh, liken that, like, Pearl Jam is my supernatural. Like, I'm a fan club member of Pearl Jam, and I'm a card-carrying member, and I get a free t-shirt every year, because I'm a member. Yeah, for sure. Well, you have to pay for it. I mean, you, Worth you, it. you pay to be a member. How? Uh, on your card of the Eddie Vedder fan club membership. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's Pearl Jam. It's, Pearl Jam. it's called the Ten Club. The Ten Club. Yeah. It says member since... 1993. Well done, sir. Yeah. yeah. That's awesome. I got a, yeah, I've got a, a really low number. And, then, and where that comes in handy is when they're in concert and I buy tickets, I buy the fan club tickets, and I have one of the first, some of the first choices of seats, because I'm such a long-standing member. Like the people in the front row. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Hi. I was wondering, uh, as you're both musicians, uh, if there's anyone you would like, any uh, other musician you would like to um, sing with, like any famous one or some specific thing you would like to do? Um, 
I mean, there's, I have like the answer that I would say, but like if it ever came to fruition, I think I'd be, I'd like clam up. I'd be too nervous, you know what I mean? Um, I mean, there's a bunch, but like honestly, I'm really drawn to, to people at the moment who um, emote in a way through their lyrics where you listen to them and it just puts you in a place. Um, so as far as like a singing or performance, I would, I'd love to sing with this person, but to sit down and write a song and to see their process and see how they do it. Um, someone like Jason Isbell, um, who, you know, you hear his songs, you hear his lyrics, and it, it's just, you're like, how, how do you paint that picture with two lines, or one line, you know? Um, it's, it's very inspiring, so I'd say probably that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd love that too, like to go through the process with them. Um, what was I watching the other day that was, it was something, and I just, I'm trying to think now, but um, yeah, if I could go through like the Radiohead recording process, that would be fascinating. Although sometimes, you know, with some people, you almost don't want to see it because you don't want to see behind the curtain. You just want to enjoy the art and not, I mean, my, my nightmare scenario is that someone I really love is not a nice person. You know what I mean? You hate it when you find that out. But um, Eddie Vedder, I mean, like, honestly, I, I, I have dream, a recurring dream that I'm allowed on stage and we play together. I, I, it's crazy. And my dreams are not, I, I have very, like, real dreams. It's, it's not like, mm, what did that mean? <laughs> you know, I, I, I'll, I'll dream that, like, Jason and I played music together. Like, it's like, oh, because we just did. Um, anyway, so I, dream, I have this recurring dream that I might like, get to play with Eddie Vedder. But, it, like, it's, it's real. I, I'm really, it's really happening. I have no doubt that that will happen. <laughs> I hope so. Maybe, maybe it's another prophecy. Yeah, maybe it is. <laughs> Toilet paper, Eddie Vedder. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I, I, and I met Eddie Vedder a couple of times, um, but the most recent time I, I, clam, I clammed up like an idiot. I really clammed up like a dum-dum. Can you walk us through that, just out of curiosity? <laughs> well, I mean, I've told this story before, but um, I, I, the, the first time I met him was at a, a Pearl, uh, Lollapalooza 92, and uh, the rumor was that he was gonna be walking around, because they, they played at like two in the afternoon, they were not as popular. They had one album out, they weren't as popular as like, you know, Red Hot Chili Peppers, who were the headliners. So they played at like two, and afterwards, Eddie would sort of walk around at the merch tent, and we, knew, we heard that, so we were wandering around the merch tent looking for Eddie, and sure enough, we saw him. This was pre-cell phone, so we had a camera <laughs> that you'd have to take to Rite Aid and get developed, like that kind of thing. So we're like, Eddie, can we take your picture? And he's like, no, nah, I don't really do pictures, but he's like, I'll remember your faces. And he goes like that. And I was like, wow. So at every show, I've seen them maybe 40 times. And at every show, I'm like, he sees me. <laughs> so then my friend um, knew the artist Ben Harper. And Ben Harper was opening up for Eddie when Eddie was playing at a solo tour. And he came through LA. And my friend was like, hey, do you want to go? Ben Harper's got, can, you know, we'll hang out. So we, we went and we got backstage because we knew Ben and somehow, you know, certain things, just luck would have it that people kind of peeled out and my friend and I found ourselves in Eddie Vedder's green room with, or dressing room with Eddie Vedder um, and there were a couple other people, Ben Harper and me and my, my friend and her boyfriend. It's just us, it was like seven people in the room sitting in a circle, Eddie's, smoking and sort of talking about the show and and, and I was disappointed at first because of this he didn't necessarily know who I was or maybe he did but he was being shy about it and so then um, he I had like two moments to like that to really connect with him and the one the one was like it's so embarrassing the way he played this song it's called Ark it's off a of Pearl Jam album he played it and I asked him about it but I was like I was like say so you know, what was that song? And I knew what song it was. But he was like, oh, it's a song called Art, it's called Pearl Gem, you know, blah, 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 blah. And, and I just, I felt dumb. I was like, God, that was a dumb question. And she was like, I know what song that is. But I asked what the song was. And then, so I was like, okay, my, my next moment was, it was me and a, a woman here and then Eddie talking to somebody else and Eddie smoking. And he, 
he had a pack of cigarettes next to him. And this was uh, 15 years ago, I don't know, 12 years ago. Um, I, I don't touch cigarettes anymore, but there was a moment where like, sometimes if I was out, I'd smoke a cigarette. So I was like, hey, um, can, you, can you ask Eddie if I could have a smoke? And she's like, why don't you ask him yourself? And I was like, uh, I'm shy. And so Eddie, where Jason is, talking to somebody else, just was like this with the cigarettes. Because <laughs> he heard me. <laughs> and that was it. He didn't even look at me, but he, he did like a fucking cool dude. He was just like, yeah, cigarettes. But, and I was like, oh my God, he heard my voice. <laughs> and then they were like, oh, we gotta go. And Eddie left on his tour bus, and that was my moment. Do you still have the cigarette? <laughs> did, you, did you smoke the cigarette? Did you keep it? Forever? I did, I did, because then I, you know, I, I had to. I, I choked my way through the cigarette, but I should have kept it. Uh, I, it's funny. I uh, Vetter is so unique in that way because he, his, his fan club, are it has members of it that have their own fan clubs. You know what I mean? Like a lot of actors and musicians and, and people of note are huge Eddie fans, Vedder yeah, fans, totally. you know? Yeah. Um, do you, have you ever met Patrick Warburton? Uh, he's a fan, yeah. No, I, I never have. I mean, he, he, his, I'd be curious where his fan club member, it's probably similar right. to yours. And Jared Padalecki. And Jared, yep. Huge fan, and, he, and also has a, a, a story about meeting Eddie, and it involves a cigarette, and he acted like an idiot. Like Jared, yeah. Jared had acted like an idiot because he was like, Ugh. yeah, yeah, because he's like, he's just like, to like certain people, he's like it's the, the ultimate dude. rock star. Yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, like, was, you hear the stories of like a, a room full of Hollywood celebs, and like Madonna walks in or Cher, you know, and everyone's like, That's Cher. yeah, yeah, you know, or like Paul McCartney. I mean, yeah. people flip out. Um, and the thing about Eddie Vedder is because I know this from reading articles about him and stuff. Is he was so incredibly inspired by Pete Townsend and, you know, that kind of classic rock and, and uh, Neil Young. And so he's, he's channeling those guys, you know, and he's been able to meet and work with those people. But, but what he's doing is, is really just channeling those other people that came before him. And they were channeling people before them. So that's what's kind of cool about music, you know. It's okay to do that. Yeah. You're, not, you're not stealing, you're just inspired. Unless it's Tom Petty. What's that? Unless it's Tom Petty. And then what? Then you get sued. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> too much? Too soon? Hi! Hello! Hi. Um, I have a question for the both of you. Um, have you guys ever really listened to music from different countries with different languages? And if you did, what language or song stuck with you the most? I... Uh... Having spent as much time in Italy as I have, I really wanted to, to learn an Italian song. So I went and did a bunch of research and listened to a bunch of Italian music, and this one song particularly stood out to me. Um, and so that was Bella Ciao. And um, I've always enjoyed playing that song. Um, I would say singing that song, but really I'm playing it because the crowd sings it, and it's amazing. Um, we but yeah, that would probably my biggest. Sung it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be the song that I think of from that question. Um, I really like Sika Ros a lot. They're Icelandic, and they sing a lot in their native language um, because you don't know what they're saying. I don't know what they're saying, but um, I really I love their music, and it feels like I'm in Iceland because I've never been, and I'd love to go. Um, so I really like them a lot. Um, my kids like the K-pop bands from Korea. They really like all of those. BTS. Boy, yeah. Blackpink. There you go. No doubt. All them. And um, who else do we like from other countries? Oh, I like uh, a couple Fr French bands. I love Air. They're French. I really like them a lot. Mm -hmm. I, I, I find myself listening to uh, French soul sometimes. Oh, yeah? it's, it sounds exactly like uh, American soul, but um, they, it's French. Yeah. <laughs> it's really weird how that works. It's mind boggling. And obviously, Jamaican music. I mean, I love Jamaican music. Um, 
and there's some great Brazilian music. Um, yeah, a lot of great South American artists. Can I just recommend Swiss music? Yes, <laughs> please. Switzerland. Yeah. Tom, as I'm saying things, I'm like, no, that's the wrong answer. But give us a give us a name. Tell us what to check out. Uh, Blake would probably Blake be Blake Wood. Blake Wood. Blake Wood. Just would just, probably just, be a good one. Oh, Blake, <laughs> got it. Um, so I think <laughs> I was looking at Blake Wood. Okay, Blake. Thank you very much. Um, I think I think that's it, our time. Okay. But what should we? And should we send everyone to lunch on a song? On a tune? Can we? Yeah? Is that right? Um, you're gonna have to hold the mic. One. <laughs> Anybody have a pick that I threw out Only last night? <laughs>
Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you soon. Have a good lunch. We'll see you soon. That was only 10 seconds. <laughs> Thank you.